Protesters demand the end of Egypt's military-led rule. But where does the army get its power from? And as Egypt's second revolution gathers steam, what is the military likely to do next? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Sika. Egyptian activists are continuing to put pressure on the military to give up power. Hundreds of thousands of people have been flocking to Cairo's Tahrir Square over the last three days, resulting in clashes that have killed dozens of people and left hundreds injured. Demonstrators fear the military intends to hold on to power, whatever the outcome of any elections. They're calling on Egypt's military leadership, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, better known as SCAF, to hand over power. Well, the U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has expressed concern about the intentions of the military council in a speech. She warned that if over time the most powerful political force in Egypt remains a room full of unelected officials, they will have planted the seeds for future unrest and Egyptians will have missed a historic opportunity. She went on, when unelected authorities say they want to be out of the business of governing, the U.S. expects them to lay out a clear roadmap and abide by it. Well, most of the American aid to Egypt goes to its military. That's according to the U.S. Congressional Research Service report. So how does it break down? Well, over the last 30 years, Egypt has been the second largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid after Israel. In 2010 and 2011, $1.3 billion went to strengthen Egyptian forces. The bulk of the military assistance goes to pay for Egypt's purchases of military hardware, upgrades to existing equipment and maintenance and support contracts. Among the big-ticket defense items that Egypt has bought from the United States are F-16 fighters, M1A1 tanks, for which General Dynamics Corps is the prime contractor, and Boeing's Chinook transport helicopters. Another $1.9 million went to training meant to bolster long-term U.S.-Egyptian military cooperation. And it's also worth mentioning that the U.S. grants Egypt about $250 million in economic assistance, and that's divided among several sectors, including health, education, economic development, and democracy promotion. So joining us now to talk more about this from Cairo are our three guests. Mona Makram Ebaid, a member of the Social Democratic Party and professor of political science at the American University in Cairo. Ahmed Salah, a political activist, and Talat Musallam, a retired major general in the Egyptian army. Welcome to all three of you. Now, Mona uh, Makram Abed, if I could start with you. Uh, is the military, in your view, trying to cling to power? Well, despite all their, uh, their, their statements about wanting to leave, they have done nothing to show us that they do want to leave. On the contrary, what they had announced is that they would not leave before the end of the referendum on the Constitution, which means uh, a year from now, if not more, end of 2012 and 2013. And this is exactly what has triggered all the anger and the frustration of a big swath of uh, Egyptian society and led them to go to the square. They want a swifter transition. Many of them now are calling for the transition to be made at the end of April 2012, that is, after the uh, the parliamentary and Shura Council elections, which end at the end of March. Now, of course, the, as we can see, the demonstration against the military have entered a new phase because it's bringing again uh, Egyptian society, not only the protesters, but uh, people who are ready to, to fight and perhaps die to force the military ruling council to change, at least. And... Uh, <clears throat> So um, um, I have been myself. I went to the city in, in, in Tahrir Square, but had to leave because of the tear gas. But people want a timetable by which the military will pledge a handover to the civilian government. They're not doing so. And now they're facing a critical decision, which is, uh, are they going to postpone the elections? If they do, they risk the wrath of the politicians and the protesters. If they hold the elections on the conditions that have become almost prohibitively unstable, we don't know the violence that might follow. So uh, people are there and those who are in the Tahrir are not thugs 
are not people that are, have been uh, financed by the outside powers as they've been accused. They are the real Egyptians without any politicians, without any banners of the Muslim Brothers or anyone else whom they think have tried to hijack the revolution. This is the second phase of an unfinished revolution. This is the second phase, but it is, I think, a decisive one because uh, there are remnants of the old regime, there is a dominant Muslim Brotherhood, and there is a police and army brutality against the protesters, which is unacceptable today. The, the, the scenes that we have seen on television yesterday were absolutely alarming. That we have um, that we have reached the point where where, uh, where where dead people were thrown in trash bins. So it is this is what has driven most of the people like myself to go down again once again in Tahrir Square, although we were against the sit-in at the beginning, and uh, and to, to 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 support the demonstrators. These are the young people. They are our hope for the future, and we certainly are supporting right. them. The the military has. Mm. Ahmed, Ahmed Salah, uh, if I could turn to your view on this. Has your faith, uh, has your trust, rather, in the army completely evaporated at this point? I never had a trust in the army to, to start with. How could you have any trust in the army? The army had been ruling this country for ever since the uh, 1952 revolution, as a matter of fact, or to be more precise, since 1954. Uh, but my question was I more. Like I mean, maybe, maybe this start. isn't. Sorry, sorry. Maybe this isn't your. You, yeah. Personally, you don't. You don't. Uh, never trusted them to begin with. But there are a lot of um, Egyptians who supported the re revolution and supported yes. the army ten months ago. So my question because is more we, about whether that we whether that trust yeah. has been lost, uh, as far as they're concerned. Yeah. The point is, we were cheated into believing that the army is going to be the guardian of this revolution. They are going to defend it, and they are going to help us uh, for uh, the transition. So we need to trust some. Uh, somebody that uh, uh, can be neutral, you know, for all the different uh, parties or groups that are involved, or even all the uh, the major part of this revolution are the individual activists uh, who are independent. Uh, and uh, fine, so they could be trusted for a smooth transition. They have vowed that they will do this in, within six months. But then there was uh, the, 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 the repeated massacres starting from the 9th of March, 9th of April. Uh, uh, the, the, the Maspiru, and uh, uh, now this continuous massacre, this war of attrition against the protesters in Tahrir and elsewhere all over the country. So there is no way to trust the, uh, the SCAF. It is getting clearer now for everyone that we were cheated. Uh, uh, we were led to believe something that is totally wrong. They are clinging to power anyway, and they will try in every possible way to maintain this power and to continue uh, uh, holding a grip uh, on this country. Major General Mussalam, I would like just to uh, yeah, go ahead. I'd like just to say one thing that I, uh, th despite the fact that I agree with most of what Dr. Mona had said, I disagree with one point. People in Tahrir are not waiting for the military to uh, uh, vow that they are going to step down uh, uh, after uh, the, the, the parliamentary elections, the Shura elections, and then we have a presidential elections. People are demanding that the SCAF should step down should step out of power right now and should leave uh, uh, its place to a civilian uh, council. Uh, we have many suggestions about a presidential council. There are all these uh, different suggestions and they are all accepted by the people out there in Tahrir and just we are giving them to the military to pick one. The most important is your job is at the borders, not oppressing the Egyptians, not shooting Egyptians, not using uh, 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 forbidding chemical weapons against the Egyptians uh, or, and uh, uh, other uh, 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 live ammunition and all these things that we are seeing uh, on, on the front lines and over there in Tahrir. Uh, Major General uh, Musallam, you've heard the views of, 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 of our first two guests there. What is your uh, opinion on all of this? And what should, uh, as, as a former military man yourself, what do you think uh, the, the role of the military should be in this current situation in Egypt? I know that I think that the main uh, object of the armed forces and the, the military council uh, now is to uh, launch or start the elections uh, which we must begin in the following week and so we can 
get out with the uh, schedule which was uh, written in the constitutional declaration before and uh, the people, the majority of the people uh, have uh, uh, answered or replied uh, to this uh, schedule and so uh, I am sure that the uh, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces is intended to uh, hand over uh, the uh, authority to a civilian but elected uh, government according to the constitutional uh, declaration. Uh, I think that what I heard, uh, that's suspicions which I believe that there are some forces which are uh, uh, feeding this, uh, 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 this uh, suspicions uh, to leave, uh, lose the uh, confidence between the people and the armed forces. When you, uh, Major General, when you talk about foreign forces that that have a hand in this, what what evidence do you have of that? Because this is a this is a an accusation that has been made by by the Mubarak regime ten months ago. Uh, I must say that uh, the that forces are not only foreign forces, but also there are some internal forces which are which think that it's uh, for its benefit to uh, lose the confidence between the army and. Uh, the people and so I believe that of course there are uh, foreign forces which uh, look for its advantage and how uh, the uh, matters so can help uh, the uh, its objects and its uh, benefits. Uh, Ahmed Salah I know you want to jump in here. Yes I would like just to uh, speak a little bit about this issue of foreign forces I wish somebody to really tell me which are these foreign forces and what are the domestic forces that are trying to interfere and for what benefit. The military, SCAF, they are the ones who did the virginity tests and never investigated this until now. They are acquitting or making mock kind of trials for the, the, the assassins of the Egyptian people in the first part of the revolution. We don't see anything serious on any level over there. They are controlling the media completely and everybody is, sh is screaming because they can't speak well uh, on Egyptian television. They cannot tell the truth on Egyptian television and many other places. Uh, the massacres started from April with uh, what happened in Tahrir. Everything is recorded on video. Uh, they go live, uh, they, they, sorry, you go in front of those cameras and they speak about uh, all these uh, 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 foreign powers and third uh, party that is uh, trying to interfere and kill both sides and all this stuff. And we wish really to see what, is the tr what are the facts here. Because at the end of the day, we discovered that we are the ones who are killing ourselves. We are the ones who are raping ourselves. We are the ones who are torturing ourselves. And maybe we are the ones who are putting ourselves in prison with now 12,000 people face, uh, that face uh, uh, military trials. And many of them, they are tortured all the time. And uh, there are horrific stories. There are videos about what has been going on in Tahrir within the last hours that show the use of forbidden weapons because you can see the bodies in the morgues and how they are somehow burnt with these chemicals and all these incredible things. So, like, I, I don't think anybody is conspiring against the SCAF except for the SCAF itself. All right, we're, we're going to talk is, a little if, bit more. If anybody is conspiring, it is the SCAF. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the, uh, the military's role in, in Egyptian society. Uh, paint a picture for you here. The military plays a unique role in, in the economy, uh, and it owns a piece of virtually every industry in the country. That includes car assembly lines, clothing factories, construction of facilities, uh, of roads, highways, bridges, housing pro projects, even pots and pans. It is the biggest land and property owner in the country, including a large number of recreational clubs, hotels and resorts. It's estimated that the army controls between 20 and 40 percent of the nation's economy. And the reasons go back about half a century. In the 1960s and 70s, the Egyptian military grew very large as a result of the wars with Israel. After peace with Israel, the need for such a large fighting force disappeared. But leaders worried about all those young men released from military service suddenly flooding the jog market. 
So the military transformed itself from a fighting force to a hiring force. And from this vast web of businesses, the military pays no taxes, employs conscripted, conscripted labor, buys public land on favorable terms, and discloses nothing to parliament or the public. And for the past 10 months, it has, of course, been running the government as well. So we're seeing there uh, what is essentially a state uh, within a state, uh, Mona uh, Makram Abed. And I, I want to put this to you. Is it realistic then to expect the army to give up all of this power so easily and so quickly? No, that's what I, so, uh, what I said before, <clears throat> that one should be pragmatic. And uh, if you know, one of the bones of contention was that the supra-constitutional principles, as they call it, would have given the military, uh, they would have placed the military largely outside the realm of judicial and parliamentary oversight. And that's what triggered and would have veto power of the next government, over the constitution, and so on. And this is in a manner to cling to their power, to their privileges today. As you rightly said, they uh, own or they master 30% of the Egyptian economy today, it is very difficult that after 60 years you will ask them to give up all this overnight. So I believe that there should be uh, a leader today, the civilian leader, whoever it is, or the politicians today, to suggest uh, <clears throat> a smooth transition of the military to the barracks. But by mean, meaning smooth is that they might, might, might have find a sort of a caveat where uh, there will not be so much under scrutiny. In all the countries of the world, there is some secrecy on military budget. I know that people will, will, uh, will contradict what I'm saying, but there must be some secrecy about the military budget. I mean, this is nothing new. And, and so I believe that there should be a pragmatic way of looking at these things in order not to in order to appease a bit their concerns that they will still be there, that there will still be uh, the power behind the curtain, and even if we don't agree to that, they will still wield power behind the curtain. So we might as well, you know, have some sort of a compromise and an understanding of what the role of the army should be. Uh, Turkey had done something at the beginning, at the very beginning, where the army was the guarantor of democracy. We don't have these basis of secularism here for the army to do so, and they don't have the political experience to do so. But uh, I'm sure there is a, a, mm -hmm. a, a kind of a patriotic role that you can give them where they can be responsible of... Uh, of a guarantee of the constitution. It's true that it's the people that will guarantee the constitution, right. but we must give a role to well, the you, army. Well, you, you bring up a valid point there about the comparison with Turkey, which I, I want to get to in just a moment. But first, I, I want to go back to Ahmed Saleh, if, if I can, and, and ask you the same question here. Um, this is a power base that the military has built up over decades now. Do you expect them to simply give up all of that overnight? Absolutely not. I think they would resist any possibility for change with every possible effort. The problem is <clears throat> it's all one big organism and it's, it's all one big organism that has been abusing the economy of this country in many different ways. Many of them were uh, 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 not really above suspicions as of course everybody knows. For example, we've never heard that Egypt produces gold before the revolution and then suddenly we discover that some are saying we are the fourth uh, biggest country producing gold in the world or something. There are lots of weird things that we keep discovering all the time about uh, the amount of uh, uh, blindness that the Egyptian people are forced uh, uh, to be in. And uh, uh, I think in front of all this power and wealth, of course, there will be a lot of resistance. But there are lots of calls from many people out in the street that we are willing for a compromise that is not giving too much power, but would give immunity. So uh, in a way of like how to make a transition, uh, uh, the, these uh, uh, immunity cases, uh, we have seen them before in some countries, so that there are forgiveness and, and all this, and then we can let them go, but they have to stop these crimes. These crimes must stop immediately, and those that are directly responsible must face justice. 
Major General Masalem, is the army uh, really prepared at this point to, to be accountable or to eventually take orders from a civilian authority? <laughs> I am sure that the armed forces are ready to uh, be uh, accountable and uh, uh, they have to uh, be under the uh, political uh, leadership. We uh, all know that the uh, military strategy must be uh, uh, according to their political leadership and the politi uh, Egyptian policy. Uh, I think that all the uh, armed forces know that and want that and are uh, working to get that. And I uh, must say also that even uh, when uh, Mubarak was there, it was not a military uh, rule, but it was a civilian rule. Uh, and the president was from uh, military origin and not a military man. Ahmed Salem. Um we talked to, you know, the example of Turkey was mentioned earlier. Do you believe that uh, what's happened in, with modern Turkey, that could be held up as uh, eventually a model for Egypt? There you had a, a military that remained powerful for many years, uh, but eventually their power slowly rolled back. Is that something that you could see happening in Egypt in the future? If you ask any Turkish person, they would tell you that during that uh, era that uh, some people think that we should... Uh, have our transition into, uh, I, th I don't think the Turkish people were happy. I think that many of them were suffering. There were lots of terrible things happening there in Turkey. <coughs> Freedoms were oppressed. Governments were overthrown by the military. And everything was totally controlled by the military. I would like to see a Turkey like uh, a, a model of Turkey like what we see now. In any nation in the world, if they wish to flourish, then freedoms must be ensured. There is no way that uh, a military hierarchy and system can ensure freedoms because this goes in opposition with the idea of having an army in the first place. The army's job is not to have freedom. They have to follow orders. This is a, the basic duty of a soldier. If they would start arguing, then they cannot do what is needed to be done. But this is not what should happen in a society. So if we wish to build a state, if we wish to build a modern state, if we wish to make Egypt a country that uh, uh, where everyone gets the rights, where freedoms are ensured, where equal rights are ensured to everyone, then there is no way that this could happen with any military rule in politics, in governing. The military have a job. It's a very important job. It's a very essential job in any country that is defending this country, defending the borders, not playing politics. Where can we see in the whole world one nation that is flourishing, where people are happy, that is governed in any way by the military. I wish somebody answers me. Mona Makrem, uh, where do you see the United States role in this, given that um, it, it uh, uh, gives $1.3 billion a year, as we mentioned, to the Egyptian military? That has got to be a powerful uh, bargaining chip. So given that, um, what would you like to see uh, from, from Washington? Do you want to see more pressure, pressure applied uh, to, to, the, to Egypt's military? I think the, the, the United States should keep away from everything now. The only thing that we demand them to do is to support to the democratic transition of Egypt. There is no way that we need uh, mil uh, U.S. intervention or any foreign intervention, but we need support, support for a democratic transition. That's what we are looking for. And... Uh, and support for a smooth transition of the military to the barracks. Because as we said, it is impossible to expect it overnight. So we have to, uh, to watch this very carefully. And I think the, the political parties here have a big role to play. It's not enough to run for elections and to try to get the most of the, uh, of the gains. Today, you have to think of the future of Egypt. You have to have a vision of Egypt, what the role of the civil society is, what the role of the military should be, and what the role of the political parties, what are they offering to these young people who have lost their lives in the, in, in, for the sake of a democratic, civic, and modern Egypt, a All new right. Egypt. 
that we on, all want. And on that, we are going to have to uh, leave it there because we're out of time. I want to thank all three of our uh, guests, uh, Mona Makram Abed, uh, Major General Talat Musallam, and Ahmed Saleh in Cairo. Many thanks for your time. Now, that's it for this edition of Inside Story. Thanks for watching. Remember, you can also join the conversation online. Just send us your views at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. Latest news is up next. Bye for now.